the mind, like you had concerns about money and scarcity and so forth, and those always play out in the world mm -hmm. in terms of some kind of confrontation or some kind of a... With, yeah, like you're, like you're not playing by the rules and a, almost like if you withdraw money from a, a, a certificate or deposit or something, you have to pay interest for early withdrawal penalties and but that all played out. And also the structure thing, because I think all of us know that, that as you go through this spiritual journey, there's a certain amount of, of inner discipline and that is required. You know, if your mind's been judging, 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 it's got a bad habit of judging, 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 and now you're going to try to withdraw your mind from this bad habit. It, it seems to take a discipline, whether it's A Course in Miracles workbook lessons, or meditation practices, or Tai Chi, yoga, could be, you know, one of hundreds of things. Just studying even, studying books, uh, there's just many pathways, so, so it was almost like there's a, a sense of inner discipline that's required, and they were reflecting that and saying, you have to choose a path, you have to follow mm -hmm. the rules. Mm -hmm. You have to have special clothes, you know, and jeans, uh, because the, the clothes I was used to, but they said, no, you have to dress up. Have the men dressed a certain way, the women dressed a certain yeah. way. They had a group of men that were there that apparently had devoted their life, and so there was not supposed to be a woman in their presence, so when she was out taking a walk, Uh, you know, they would, she would be steered away, as if, like, it could, you Isn't know. Isn't that just the same as really all organized religion? Yeah, just another so form. So, any yeah, single forward, organized yeah. religion, we could spend a lot of time investigating and delving into it, but, you know, there is so many of these organized religions that this is the thing that actually makes us share in common, that we're not interested in organized religion, we're interested in actually yeah. uncovering Experience. our own inner, yes. you know, wisdom and... Yes. Relationship. Yes, so we could even say that that organized religion, just the terms are a contradiction in terms, or we call it oxymoron, they negate each other. Organized religion. The religion's a, a spontaneous, joyful experience of love in the present moment, and organization is always of the ego. And it, admittedly, that, that there are many steps, just like an alcoholic, Uh, doesn't necessarily always have a spontaneous experience of God. They go through torturous life of, of addiction and then they maybe come to a 12-step program and those 12 steps turn out to be very helpful because it brings them a little bit of structure into a very chaotic uh, mind that needs a few steps. So, yeah, I think, and too, the, in the story, the whole thing was, it's not about anything that anybody's done wrong, and it's certainly not about putting down uh, places or people or religions in any way, but it's just, it's a walk of trust. We have to become more trusting in our own intuition, which is there as the answer. It's always the answer, it never is in a formula, or it's never in a book, or a person, or a place. And, you know, we've, we've all searched, <laughs> a lot of us, in many different ways. So. Including, I mean, I think a lot of traditional religions talk about going off and spending time alone or in silence. So a lot of the mystics and saints would go off to caves and into the woods to just be with themselves and be with their thoughts. And um, certainly A Course in Miracles is a path that even incorporates relationships and says, no, your relationships are mirrors of what's going on in your mind, and you can use that too. So you don't have to avoid relationships, or you don't have to avoid anything really in this world. That anything can be used by the Spirit, and so that adds a much more of a sense of flexibility in terms of how your path goes. Instead of thinking, oh, I, I have to get away from these things, or be around those things more, or be around like-minded people. That's even, <coughs> could be a step, but then, where do you draw the line between the like-minded people <laughs> And the unlike-minded people, you know, you always end up dividing something. Yeah. Back to one of those old we and they, or kind of things, so. Mm. And does the Course believe that everything that comes into our life, good or bad, is sort of called forth before we get here? Before we manifest ourselves? Yeah, it's all, I was, I met a woman recently in Sweden and she, I could tell she had some tears and she had an emotion and she only, her arm was, was she was born uh,
with only a, a, like a stub here and, and, she, and she told me that she came outside uh, of the session room and she just was standing next to me talking and telling me that she can remember anger at God um, for the situation with the arm dating back to when she was like a year or a year and a half old, just this fury. And she had been blaming God uh, for these circumstances, like how could you do that? How could you have me be in this world with, with this condition with my arm? And I had been just discussing that, that really the ego is the state of mind that's prior to coming to this world. So even in reincarnation systems, it's, it's like you're kind of a soul that incarnates and comes into the world, and to a, to a certain set of parents, and a country, and a culture, and so forth. And what Jesus is saying in the Course, uh, in the workbook, is he says, when you came to this world, you brought the world with you. In other words, it's much more like quantum physics is describing now, that it's almost like an imaginary world that's made out entirely out of fantasies and beliefs. And you can't point the finger at a culture, at a parent, not even at a planet, and say, why did Earth did, you know, corrupt my little soul? You know, I just came here as a happy little soul, and then the Earth corrupted it. You can't even point, point at a planet and say, uh, I, I'm a victim of the planet, because it's a sense that the ego is a belief in separation, and then the entire environment that you seem to surround yourself with, including the body, a body with one arm, is all based on ego decisions prior to even seeming to come here. They're all uh, predestined. And it's, that's where you get into deeper concepts like the script, like all of history is like, in a linear metaphor, is like a script, and it's already predestined, and it's already prearranged, and, and the ego wrote it. The ego projected out the whole script of history. And all you really have a choice on is another way of looking at it. Because it's really not even linear, it's, I think, simultaneous would be a better way when people talk about parallel universes and parallel lives. Those are all great witnesses, that it's really all happening simultaneously, and it's only the ego mind that picks out a little slice of it in, in a little, like a spaghetti string, and says, oh, this is my lifetime. Or past life regressions, when you seem to go through past life regressions, it's just still little clips, like little synopsis of memories of this linear world, which is by definition an illusion, and that that we need to open up to a new way of looking, where we can see it more in, in its simultaneous state, instead of seeing it in its linear state. Or I always say, just take the, the, the string of spaghetti and turn it on its side, mm -hmm. and you go from a line to a point. Mm -hmm. You come back to a present, a, a, a way of seeing it in the present moment, which frees it from all of its guilt and shame and hurt, just brings it all back. So yeah, it, it's like, uh, those are the things we work on in a practical way, like when Jenny's talked about at times, she'll say she's, she's very hard on herself, and she'll tell me about a decision she, she made yesterday when she did not follow her guidance, and then all the consequences that came, and then all this guilt and anger and whatever, mm -hmm. based on, on not following her guidance. She's talking about what happened the day before, and I say, well, it's the same process, you're, you're still doing the same thing. Some people do it with their childhood, some people do it, you know, with their last relationship, and some people do it with the day before, and are really hard. Does, does the, the book, and I haven't read the book in any great depth, I've begun the book, and I find it, it's a, it's a book that you really want to invest in, and does it actually um, talk about the fact that, A, you know, we create our own reality, and B, everything is exactly as it should be, there is no other perfect solution than the one you're in, that you just have to allow a chance to prove itself and to demonstrate itself. And it's our moments of distrust of the moment that we're in, that we don't celebrate it because we're too busy banging at it because we think it's actually not the question we asked or it's not the thing we demanded or it's not the thing we thought we wanted. But in fact it is the right thing. And that if we actually spend more time actually being present and saying that allow it, this is the right moment, where in the book would you actually say that that is part of it, or what demonstrations might they give? I, I imagine that that 
is the general teachings of a lot of the things I read and I know my father has been studying the book and every time he gives me an excerpt it always comes at the perfect time, it's handwritten and it's on a piece of paper that's ripped out of something and it's like, oh, thank God I need this piece of paper, you know, so yeah. it's obviously a wonderful tool, so maybe I'd like to hear about the book. Yeah. Yeah, we just talked a little bit this morning, but that's a good lead-in to that, yeah, everything is perfect. Uh, it was spoken about in the Bible where it said, all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord, and in the Course it says the same thing. All things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. It's only the ego that, that says, no, something's gone wrong, but nothing's gone wrong. Uh, it's even got a, a workbook lesson at the beginning where it's one of those early lessons, which is, I do not perceive my own best interest. It's the practice letting go of thinking you know what your own best interests are. And he slips in a line in the book which says, everything is for your own best interest. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, he's really quick to come in to say, it's all perfect. Uh, there's nothing out of alignment whatsoever. Uh, it's only a misperception when you try to, to say <coughs> from an egoic sense, no. I wanted some way else. So, in like 12-step groups with alcoholics, they have a thing called the serenity prayer, which is basically has three elements, you know, uh, what you can change, what you cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, I always tell people, of Course in Miracles, it's, it seems like a big book, 1200 and some odd pages, but it's basically the serenity prayer. What you can uh, change is is your mind. You can shift from this egoic sense of separation to a state of wholeness. You can change your mind, you can change your perspective at any instant. It doesn't have to take years or lifetimes. You can do it any instant that you want, really, really want to shift into this miraculous state of acceptance, allowance, wholeness, completion. You can shift at any moment. And what you cannot change is the script. I mean, it's a, it's a linear script from the beginning so it was made as a distortion, because eternity doesn't have a timeline in it. Uh, you know, when we were growing up in the history class, they would always put the timeline and the past, and then a little line for the present and the future. And eternity is really beyond the timeline entirely. And you might say that the present moment that they put in the middle of the timeline isn't really there either. That the ego invented its own present moment squeezing between the past and the future, and it's more like Jesus spoke in the Bible 2,000 years ago. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Look at the grammar of that sentence, before Abraham was, I am. Before time and space were, I am. The I am presence, Moses, you know, burning bush, you know, the burning bush spoke, I am that I am. Well, wow, that's pretty uh, direct. I am that I am. <laughs> If a voice is coming from a burning bush and it sounds like the voice of God, that's pretty powerful. But it's nothing about time, it's actually prior to time. So, the other aspect of your question, which I would say there's a lot of New Age teachings that, uh, that are out there now, and there's a lot of quantum physics teachings, and there's a lot of scientists and people that are in spirituality and religion that are on the cusp of starting to take a hundred percent responsibility for their state of mind. Uh, you can't blame anything or anyone for the, what you're feeling, because you're doing it to yourself. But the Course even goes beyond you create your own reality. It, Jesus would probably say it in a little way, he would say, you project your own illusion. Uh, that's, that's the way he would say it. He would never say you create your own reality. He would say, oh, no, God created reality for you, and, and God is pure love, so your reality is pure love. And even in terms of manifesting, like uh, a lot of, I know, uh, you know, Jerry and Esther Hicks were just here, and Deepak, and there's, uh, the movie The Secret is out now on, on manifesting and so forth. A lot of this create your own reality idea is circulating now. And I would say on the evolutionary ladder of spirituality, that's a big step towards 100% responsibility, that underneath it, what the people are really meaning is, all the circumstances that you believe are your reality, are there by your own making. Uh, Jesus would even take it the next step, beyond manifesting, beyond you can make whatever you want, you can have it be any way you want. He would say, well actually, 
God created you as spirit, and yeah, you have tremendous uh, capacity, but when you're playing with illusions, you can rearrange them in many different ways and make what you think are better illusions, but still, you're still playing with the, the contents of consciousness. It would be kind of like the, the Titanic has hit the iceberg, the water fills up the compartments, the ship starts to tilt, and I don't know if any of you saw the movie with Leonardo, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, Kate Winslet, where basically the engineer who built the boat was in the middle of a party. They said, uh, they told him that the sh ship had hit the iceberg and that the, how many compartments had already filled up, and he went, she's sunk. Uh, he, he knew the ship, he knew how much water it could take and how many compartments had to fill. He was an engineer, he knew it all. He knew. As soon as he found out how many compartments, even though the parties were still going on, people, most people were unaware of everything, he knew the ship would sink, because he knew his ship. Well, you might say that, that this world is, in some sense, like the sinking, sinking ship. Uh, it's not eternal, it's not going to last forever, it's very temporary, it's going down. <laughs> uh, in the sense that it never really came up, <laughs> it never really had any kind of eternity to it. So authors like uh, Gary Renard, my friend who was just here in Ireland, you know, wrote a book, uh, The Disappearance of the Universe. That's the direction where this is heading. People have listened to me speak for days or weeks, and the more they listen, the more they go, hmm, sounds like uh, if everybody was in the state of mind you're talking about, David, and if everybody followed this out to the fullest extent, uh, who would be working? Who would, who would man all and, and do all the jobs? Who would build all the things? What would happen to the factories? What would happen to the governments? What would happen to the grocery stores? And this and this. It's like you're, you're, the world as we know it would disappear. And I said, exactly, precisely. If you follow what I'm saying, mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a conclusion uh, that where this is going. So it's far from you create your own reality. That's the step in the direction, but what I'm saying is, no, Jesus would say, you project your own illusion, but once you start to forgive your projection, and you start to pull it back in, uh, you start to reach a state where you really see the peace of mind is, is not only possible, but it's inevitable. But it's also a state of mind that goes beyond manifesting. Um, I had a woman one time, at one of my meetings, she said, she came to me during the break, like the coffee break, and she said, I'm the manifesting lady. I can manifest anything. I manifest soulmates for people, and cars, and houses. I manifest money. She says, I spent years on the manifest lady. They call me the manifest lady. I said, oh, that's so sweet. I said, after the break, I want you to come and launch in and tell, tell this group, the Course in Miracles group, all your manifesting stories. So she did. She just was like, well, when she manifested this soulmate for this one, and this, this car for another, and she had lots of manifesting stories. And I had told her also, I said, we'll go through that and then I'll kind of take it to the next step. So after she told her stories, there were some new people to this Course in Miracles group, they were like, cool, I'm re I need to manifest a different world <laughs> than the world I'm looking to. And I was like, yeah, I can understand that. But I said, what if, you had the capacity to manifest anything in form, and, and you did it over and over and over, and it still didn't bring you a lasting sense of peace and happiness. What if there was still something underneath that was kind of going, is this, is this all there is? Yeah. Like the Peggy Lee song, you know, mm -hmm. is that all there is? What if there's something like called eternal peace, you know, what if there is a kingdom of heaven, a nirvana, a state of oneness is so perfect, so loving and joyful and harmonious that it's beyond anything that you can manifest. So, uh, my teachings have kind of taken beyond the Deepaks, beyond the Eckhart Tolle's, beyond, they asked Eckhart Tolle one time and they said, you know, why don't you talk more about that the world is a complete illusion? Uh, you should mention that more uh, in your seminars. And he said, no one would attend. Uh, if I did, we have a nice small group here. <laughs> uh, generally, I, I kind of give it so straight without any compromise, 
and just go right at the core of it, that it's not really for the masses. Do you uh, wonder that, you know, you said that if everyone got their situation and that everyone would give up work, what about the artists who absolutely love to, to draw? What about the people who love to plant? What about the people who are yeah. natural? So maybe this concept, and this is only just a thought, maybe this concept is actually a lot easier than having to everyone having to go into a situation where everything stops. Maybe it's everyone actually focuses on what they truly want because I think that everyone has a purpose and that yes we get distracted by the everyday life of our routine, be it a job, be it a routine, being a, being a mother, whatever that case may be. But there is a true calling I believe in us all which might be to write, to draw, to provide food. I, mean, I know a lot of women that without any encouragement on a monetary capacity love to care for people and love to mind people and I think that that's in every one of us. We have a natural calling whether it's, you know, people don't create art for money. Eventually they might actually get recognised but generally it's not the beginning point and I think that there's that, you know, there are great spiritual teachers, there are great, you know, people who love to help people improve in whatever it is they're doing and natural teachers other people couldn't teach for their lives and I know I certainly couldn't teach but yeah. everyone has a gift and that actually when you talk about focusing maybe that's something to be considered. Yeah, it's, it's, everyone has a gift, but I'm also giving where it's all headed, in the sense that the time is something that can be used by the Spirit to teach you that there is no time. So, it's like, um, for example, we'll take the example of the artists. I, I meet world famous sculptors, I work with artists, and some people would say that, that I, I make art every day, just by my state of being. Uh, my songs or all the stuff that I express so freely uh, without any uh, sense of monetary recompense or anything like that, uh, that my life is like art and expression. But you might have heard of a, a psychologist called Abraham Maslow. He's a very famous psychologist who did the hierarchy of needs, you know, the pyramid of needs. And, and it was very practical too because it started off with the basic needs, you know, people have needs for food and clothing and shelter, mm -hmm. then they kind of move into needs for safety and security, then needs to love and be loved, and then towards self-actualization, he called it, at the top of the pyramid. And that was just kind of like the ancient Greeks saying, know thyself, uh, you know, that's the ultimate aim of everything. But that self is, is purely spiritual in nature. It's not a mother, father, sister, brother. It's not an artist or a, a, a sheep herder or a construction worker or a CEO. Uh, people have asked, asked me point blank, uh, can I be a CEO and be enlightened? I say, nope, uh, not a chance. Because there's too many constructs that are built into the whole, whole concept of a CEO. Uh, to even play the game, uh, competition, uh, you know, without competition it's hard to be a CEO. Uh, you know, those are some basic assumptions that are part of the construct. And so, I, th I think what you're saying is, certainly the most practical thing that you can ever do is to tell people to follow their heart, follow their joy, uh, really uh, follow what deep down they feel like they want, because if you talk to most people, they would say, well, there's a, there's a number of things that I want. It's not just one thing. And that's, in this world, that's quite practical. In fact, you have to be encouraging with people. And then, just like a child, you know, if, if you have a, a household and you have a child wants toys to play with, and you give them a variety of toys, they're going to pick their favorite toys. And they're going to play with those toys, whether it's a doll or a, a little tractor that they ride or whatever, They'll play with it as long as it's fulfilling and satisfying, and then they'll just leave it. The doll gets left, the tractor gets left right in the sidewalk. And people outgrow, just like children outgrow toys, human beings outgrow things. But Abraham Maslow studied the, the self-actualizing people, for example the artist, and they found, he found that one of the characteristics of this, of the highest advanced people in history and throughout history were that means and ends were together. That for example the artist wasn't painting the painting or doing the sculpture for a future goal. Whether it's monetary goal, fame and fortune, recognition, whatever. Just in the flow of the painting, in the flow of the sculpting, 
right there in the present moment, the means, the joy, the happiness of, of extending in that way, and the end, which was the joy and the happiness, were the same. Peace is its own reward. You don't need to do anything for future peace. If you're peaceful now, that's it. So, so what I say is, yeah, it's, we need to inspire everyone, and, and everyone seems to have their gifts that are, that are given, that are, I could say, like intuitive gifts, some of them are, are latent, but they're emerging as you go along spiritually. They come out more and more, the spiritual gifts. And we want to celebrate all that. And what I talk about is the state of enlightenment, of self-realization, which is being totally present and totally disidentified from everything in the world. And totally identified with who you are, which is spirit. So when people can say what they want about the Course in Miracles, about countries and Americans or Europeans or this or that. I have absolutely no opinion on anything. I, I tell people from the beginning, I have no opinion on anything. From abortion to global warming to economics or anything. I've been in university for 10 years. I've read it, seen it, talked to people. I've been in 21, 22 countries and it's like in the end, it's just a bunch of symbols to me, and they don't mean anything in and of themselves. I'm not interested in, in concepts where people want to identify with being mothers or fathers or sisters or brothers. Spiritual teachers, uh, you know, people will talk to me about politicians, you know, Saddam Hussein or Osama Bin Laden, George Bush or whatever. <coughs> I, I was in Argentina back in 2003 and and if my friend Maria put me up in her house and said, you know, you can stay in my son's room. And his uh, son was about 22, 23 years old, and so I was saying hi to him and everything, and greeted him and everything. And, but he was very upset, and, and uh, all I, I remember him saying as I was walking up to the room to go to sleep was, How long will the bush lovers be staying in my room? <laughs> uh, that was the way I, I was going to bed. So I went upstairs and my friend David was with me and we both stayed up in that room. Lunch is ready. Lunch is ready. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks. So I came, came down the next morning, and I should put it in the context, this was also the time when uh, the United States had just begun uh, dropping bombs on, um, on Baghdad. And there was a huge anti-American sentiment down in in uh, Argentina, and I was doing 19 consecutive healing gatherings on 19 consecutive days. This was kind of in the middle of it. And so, it wasn't like it was out of context. Uh, I certainly wasn't shocked or surprised by it at all. But I did come down to breakfast the next day, and I sat down, and he was sitting kind of growling and grumbling. And I said, uh, I said, I heard what you said as I was going to bed last night. And he said, oh, well, good. I'm glad you heard it. And, and I said, but you know, it's not entirely true. Uh, and he said, what? And I said, I'm a Saddam lover too. And he was like, his mouth just dropped and thus begun uh, our conversations where he was, he was telling me all about the babies are dying, the palms are dropping on their heads, and it was quite emotional. And I was calmly looking right into his soul and, and, and talking to him from my heart where I felt no attachment or defense one way or the other towards any of it. But I could see that it was all an illusion, and, and I, could, I was in the state of love. And over time, I would go back to visit down there in Argentina, and he ended up leaving his job as a political writer for the newspaper. And the last I heard from him, he was wanting to publish A Course in Miracles down in Argentina in Spanish. Uh, you know, it, he's just a reflection of my mind. Like, I was sure of who I was. I didn't buy into any of the opinions. and. Of course, he's now reflecting the joy, and I could go on and on, talked about how our relationship has just grown and grown in, in happiness and joy. But it started off with, how long will the bush lovers be staying in my room? That was our, that was our starting point. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, it's just, all of life is just fun and it's joyful, but it's, but it's, when we have these times, it's just good to, Kind of get get at the underpinnings of the fun, so that you can really kind of have the experience. I have something, but it's 
and I, you touched on it earlier, and it's the part of the metaphysics of the course I find most difficult, which is the script is written. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the script is written, and I can read with the course, and the script is written, and my choice is how I respond to that or how I perceive that. And then there's the whole upswing of people working with the secret and manifesting, and if you're manifesting in this illusion, well, why not manifest yourself a nice, fun illusion? Mm -hmm. and, and somewhere between the two, I sometimes become paralyzed, for want of a better word. Mm -hmm. Am I going to work on manifesting something more fun? Am I surrendering? Do, do you hear what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anything into that realm yeah. of, there's, a, there's a, just a spot where I become paralyzed, it's like my blind spot. Am I going to put energy into creating or am I going to surrender? I guess that's my answer, isn't it? Am I surrendering? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. To me, the, the greatest fun is, yeah. the, is in the surrender. Is in the surrender. Do I want to control it by making a happier illusion? And so many people now, particularly in Ireland, are caught up in the whole, the secret and the Moses code and the manifesting. And I'm looking at them saying, no. And yet sometimes I want a happier illusion too. Yeah. Want the fun things. Yeah. But, yeah so. Well, it's it's right. You're on the cusp of this, this whole yeah. thing because it's yeah. obviously the all the stuff that's coming with the manifesting and everything. It's a, it's a it is itself a leap in consciousness from Absolutely. from being a victim of the world or feeling powerless or helpless. It's a mm -hmm. huge, huge leap in the right direction, and and yet for those that that start to go even deeper than that, then. Uh, like a friend of mine was talking about uh, Eckhart Tolle's new book, A New Earth, and she said, hmm, it's just, it's like it, it, it brings together some basic ideas from the Course in kind of a, more of a, a general way, but she, she just says, I'm not satisfied with it. I, I want, you know, I want to just, I feel there's something that's going, going on much deeper and I want to tap into that. And I think actually, as I asked the question, and, and it's a, a lesson of the, of the work that you mentioned earlier, the one that says, I don't know what I want anyway. I don't know how to manifest what's good for me. I, I forget what to ask. I get, I get to that point where I'm yeah. sure how would I know what's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah so and I don't. Yeah. But it's, it's tempting. It's a, it seems, as you're going mm -hmm. into it, like a very much of a dismantling or a dissolving experience. Mm -hmm. It seems, while you're still holding on, to the ego, to the less vestiges of the ego, that it's disorienting. It's, mm. it's very disorienting. Mm. Um, we have a friend, Jason, who's who was down uh, doing a, a session like this down in uh, Australia, and he was in the middle of the session, and people started to ask him questions, and he just eased back into the state where he didn't know what anything was for. He was like looking at the the course, which the book was right in front of him, and the words were always, were all of a sudden looking very funny in the book and everything. And he could kind of, it was very still. He could see the people's mouths moving, and it was like, kind of like, am I supposed to respond here? Is there something to say? And then he watched his mouth kind of involuntarily saying, yes, Jesus talks about this, and, and pointing to a certain passage, but he was almost like watching all that occur, and, and he was just feeling so detached from everything, just like, like, like you are in the middle of the soup, <laughs> like you are the soup mm -hmm. liquid, mm -hmm. going very liquid and fluid and flowing, you know, and not, not even being able to hold together a, a simple concept like, like sitting and having a little teaching session around the Course, that that all started to just evaporate and dissolve. Yeah. And when he would, he came to me and he just said, wow, is this, did you have these kind of experiences? I said, oh yeah, it's, you just, you just relax and you just ease mm -hmm. into them because it's like, there's a part of the mind that wants to judge that it's losing control, but the spirit of, is never losing control, it never had mm -hmm. control, it never tries to control. It's, it's from the ego's perspective that it can feel like, Things are being taken away from you. It can feel like sometimes, oh, I want a better, uh, if this is a dream, I want a better mm -hmm. version of the dream. And what this is, is more just a, an easing back into a state of non-judgment, mm -hmm. where 
everything is perfect in that realm and there's nothing to strive for, nothing to attain, uh, no process uh, to go through, it's just this, it's a state of mind. And the ego does quite a bit of kicking and screaming as you get closer to relaxing into it, because the ego feels like it's dying or that it's uh, losing its sense of existence uh, when you just ease into that, that peace. Can I ask just, when you were going through that process of kind of letting go mm -hmm. and trying to step back from the ego and fight it and so on and so on, did, did there come any points where you just thought, this is too hard, I can't keep on fighting this or, you know, it's, is, did there come a point where you thought it was easier to slip back into the illusion, as horrible as that might have been, or to keep on trying to step back out of it and doing the work and doing the work and stepping back? I, I don't think I have ever had one of those points. I mean, I have had intense, intense emotions, and particularly even prior to the Course, uh, when it all already was happening, and I didn't even have any kind of context for it. Right. I just thought, oh, this is intense. This is intense. Like, I, I just wanted out of it. Uh, it was just so intense. But I, I had the context when I came across the Course, where even when I had friends or students that would just come up to me and say, David, do you, have you ever had a moment with the Course where you've just looked at it and you go, what if this is a hoax? What if this whole big, whole thing is just another trick and a hoax and everything? And I just looked at him and I said, no, I've never, I've never once had any of those experiences because it was such a, a huge recognition for me that it was beyond question, question yeah. absolutely beyond question. I mean, so when the students would say, you know, don't you ever wonder if this is even a hoax? I said, no, I don't wonder that. There were times, even in working with the Course, where it seemed really fast, like it was going really accelerated. Mm -hmm. And they always would say, you know, you could never get more than you can handle. And there's a couple times where I would say, well, <laughs> uh, I know I never get more than I can handle, but I must be maxing out here or something. <laughs> One time I was working with the Course and I was doing a job coaching experience and uh, I was with, uh, working with a young man about 18 years old and um, training him to be a busboy at a, at a hotel and we would have some talks occasionally but, but sometimes his behavior would seem to get erratic, his voice would like drop down three octaves to this deep kind of voice and it really was something like The Exorcist or something, it, was, it looked like uh, there I was working and just pretty new with the course and, and it looked like what the world might call almost like a demonic possession or something. And I was like, thinking like, oh my God, what is this? And then it progressively got more and more intense to the point where um, I was with him. It was Friday the 13th, the full moon, and I'm like, I don't even believe in these things. It's just a bunch of oh, hooey, demonic possessions and Friday the 13th and full moons and all this. His voice up down, there's this weird thing going in his eyes and everything, and I'm going like, whoa, this is kind of steep here for an early Course in Miracles student. Hello, welcome. And eventually, and the people around him were getting spooked, and, and uh, they eventually had a, called the life squad and had to take, he was taken away, he's like 18 years old. But uh, before he, he left, we had part of my job coaching uh, presence experience that time was to train these people and, and help them out on their job. So I was training them as a busboy and there were these long narrow steps that were real slippery. It was a restaurant with all this slop that comes from the kitchen of a restaurant. And one of our tasks was to take this heavy uh, trash can that must have weighed, I don't know, a couple, two or two, 250 pounds or something. It was very heavy because it was full of all this slop and this wet stuff from the restaurant, down these narrow steps that were very slippery uh, and take it out to the, to the waste can. And I remember we drug the thing, me and him, to the, ed to the edge of the steps and he just looked at me and his eyebrows went up like uh, Jack Nicholson in some kind of Jack Nicholson movie and he went, you first! And I was like, ooh, this is a little bit uh, steep here. I'm, I'm pretty new to this course. I remember coming home that night and just going into silence meditation and, and praying about it. I, say, I said that, I said, this is getting a little steep and a little intense and 
The Spirit said, no, I'm just showing you the map of, of your heart. It's only the own, your own fear that you have of love. There's no demonic possessions, there's nothing about Friday the 13th or full moons and all the, that stuff. It's just a projection, but it's your own fear. I'm, I'm showing you your, your, the limits of love and your own fear that you're placing around your own heart. It's like, okay, okay. It was, but it's, it's been, seems pretty steep at times. But there never really was a point where I thought, I just want to go back to the way that it was. Uh, I have had students who have attempted that. I have had people that I've known who have said, nope, don't want to go there. I just want to pretend I never saw what I saw. I've never gone where I've gone and I want to kind of, oh, well, kind of like in the Matrix, uh, there's a the cipher character. The <laughs> but there was a character in there, basically, he just wanted to be put back right. in the Matrix, you know. Mm -hmm go back into the amnesia, and, uh, and it may even seem to be possible for people in this world, but really, the deeper you go and the more that you experience, the more difficult it is, because uh, there's nothing really to go back to. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like in the Bible, they had the story of Lot's wife, you know, don't look back or you'll turn into a pillar of salt. It was, I remember as a child watching uh, the movie, you know, I guess it was the Ten Commandments or, or something, and, and it was a shocking kind of uh, image of this woman turning into a pillar of salt. Now I see it just was, the, the metaphor was that when you turn back to the past, you just freeze, your consciousness just freezes, it loses its fluidity, the flow of it all. I see it now as just a symbol, but uh, I've had people talk to me about that experience of, of the feeling, but I've never had that. For me it was, like I'm jumping in the pool and I'm, I'm going down the slide and I'm, I'm, I'm not even got my fingernails out on the, on the side of the slide. It's tucked in, wee, let's go for the big splash, you know. And, and I've found that that's been the joy, that's the fun of it, is when you don't resist and when you, when you really yield and surrender into it, it's very gleeful, very joyful and it's the, it's the resisting part, uh, of course, it gets quite intense when the ego is trying to resist love, because love is love, and love just will always be what it is, and the ego, in fact, Jesus says, he defines resistance in a positive way. He said, resistance is the ego's experience of progress and growth. Mm -hmm. So, whenever you're in resistance, just remember that, that the pro again? resistance is the ego's experience of progress and growth. So even when you have resistance, the progress and growth is continuing, it's just that the ego is interpreting against it and trying to say, you know, I can't do this, it's too hard, I have to go back. It's just kicking and screaming, uh, like, like it's being dissolved away, and it is being dissolved away. And it is within you, I mean, Yes. Every, all the answers are within you. Yes. I was saying to you earlier, when I was a, a lot younger, back in 1983, <laughs> <laughs> so I was a lot younger in 1983, <laughs> um, I was in the police force and uh, had a very bad experience. I got thrown from a building and ended up in hospital. I spent about seven days unconscious. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up, they'd sort of done two or three operations. And they said, well, the doctors, two doctors standing in front of me, I can visualize it now, I feel two angels, but these were not really two angels. And they were standing in front of me saying, well, the good news is you're alive. Bad news is, uh, make up your mind and I'm going to walk again. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, why is that with damages, spine and hips and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. So I said, well, are you sure about that? Oh yeah, we're sure. I said, well, actually, I'm not sure. You know, because I, I just can't accept that. You know, I've been playing rugby for mm. two or three times a week mm. and that sort of thing. And I wasn't going to give that up. I was not going to give that up. And the more I sort of, the more I thought of it, the voice was saying to me, look, you know, don't listen to that. Listen to yourself. If you think you can do it, do it. And the thing that came into my mind was, you remember the film, The Battle of Britain, not The Battle of Britain, um, Reach for the Sky. Douglas Bailey yeah. story. Douglas Bailey was um, a fighter pilot in the Second World War. 
negatively lost both legs in a flying accident before the war. And they said, you'll never fly again. They turned out to be one of the greatest fighter pilots there ever was, you know. And I can remember this image of him in the film where they said, we're not going to walk again. You haven't got your legs. And he was pulling himself along on parallel bars. And the whole sort of experience of it was in my mind, you know. And I thought, no, hang on, that's me. That is me. That film was actually made for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> First, yeah. That was my cue to get into this, this whole thing. And within about three months, I was walking again. Uh -huh. And because I said, no, I'm not going to give in to this. Uh -huh. And fortunately, there were, it was actually nurses, really, that were more positive than the doctors. Uh -huh. So I was saying, well, if you think you can do it, we'll take you to the gymnasium. Mm. You know, we do this, we do the exercises and that sort of thing. And eventually, well, you can see now, fairly normal, except up here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, really, I, I just sort of had that thing in my mind, if you like, that, that moment of the bright light came on. And it said, no, forget what they're saying, don't listen to that. And of course, now I know, it was ego. It was them, but it was me, actually, my ego in them. Yeah. Saying, no, you know, you're not going to walk again, and me saying, get out of here. Of course I'm going to walk again, yeah. you know. Yeah. I did. Yeah. So it does work. That's many, many years before I heard of the Course of Miracles. Yeah. yeah. An actual living experience yeah. of, of the power of the mind and consciousness. Yeah. And very much like the, they call the, him the miracle man in the, the movie The Secret. The man who was in the, the big crash and basically was just laying there and was unable to about anything. He was even on an artificial breathing machine and then uh, basically he had it in his mind that he would walk walk out of that hospital by Christmas and then slowly did, you know, mm -hmm. went from what people would say basically being almost like a vegetable into doing that. But And those are, it's, those are powerful, powerful experiences that show you that you do have all the answers within you, that, that the only limits that anyone has is what they're placing on themselves. And then there's sayings from the Bible about, you know, if you had the, the faith of, of a, like the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you know, you could move mountains. And we think of mountains, you know, in, in a much larger context even than the human body, you know, it's just, they seem massive. Uh, but it goes way beyond the mountains, that's why it's, it's like, one time the scribe of A Course in Miracles, who was a research psychologist was talking to Jesus and she really wasn't into the New Age at all, you know, she wasn't, she was a research psychologist, a very clinical research psychologist and, and she, she was learning for the first time about things like astrology and so forth and she was almost like very, like a child would ask questions like, well what's this thing with astrology? It seems like there's a correlation between the movements of the planets and the spheres and the lives of men and women. There seems to be some kind of correlation, but you're teaching me that everything is in my mind, everything's a decision in mind, and Jesus said, yeah, you're moving all of those billions of bodies around on the planet, and behind that you're moving all the spheres around with your mind. Mm -hmm. And I, re I remember uh, reading that and just in absence from Felicity, I think it was, and just almost fell off the bed of the power of the mind, like moving mountains is, is nothing in this cosmos that goes they're still discovering new galaxies, you know, it's, it's much, much bigger than anyone ever thought. And, and that's what they said also in, uh, in the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? You know, it's always larger, it's always bigger than what, what you can conceive of. So, to go for a, a highly trained state of mind, you know, where you have constant peace is a very lofty goal, but it's like, Basically, we were told over and over, you are worthy of this goal. You are worthy of constant peace, of serenity, of joy and happiness, love. And I just recently uh, was in Australia and uh, we got this invitation, um, Jenny and I, to be f flown up to Palm Cove, which is up near Cairns, uh, very tropical, they're near the rainforest and it's up closer to the equator down there in, in Australia, by this uh, captain, he was the captain of Qantas Airlines, uh, a pilot, and uh, he said, I'll fly you up there, I'll fly you back, take as long, take a week if you want, take as many days as you want, um, you know, 
would just be, be our guest and my wife and I would love to be up there and either I'll be there to pick you up or there'll be a limousine waiting for you and I was like looking at Jenny going, limo? Hmm, I've never, I've never been in a limo before. He said, I'll either be there to, personally to pick you up or there'll be a limo waiting for you. So we got up there and uh, there was no limo. There he was, this big man with his both his arms outstretched like, come here you little, just to give us a big bear, bear hug. And he was beaming and glowing and uh, one of his first questions to me was, he said, David, if I wanted to be your shadow, if I wanted to just be your shadow and come wherever you are in the world for six weeks, and I could fly there and come and I'd pay all my expenses and everything, but could I, could I, could I, could I, could I just uh, come and be and shadow you around for six weeks? I said, sure. And he said, great, that's all I needed to know. And then he, he got into sharing all this love and joy and basically he was like a, like a five-year-old child in a 61-year-old body, uh, just beaming and glowing. And he just listens to The Course of Miracles all hours and hours, just listens to it, uh, the audio thing. And then he, he's listened to all of my materials. I had no idea, I just put a bunch of it on the web so people can freely download it and listen to it. I, I don't, I had no clue of how much. He said, oh there's 400 hours, David, you have 400 hours of free material in there. He said, which I have listened to, by the way, and twice, <laughs> for 800 hours, and do you have any new material? I said, well, we're always traveling and filming and everything, but he was just like a sponge, you know, he's originally from Hungary and he'd been like, like a little child soaking up all this. And he'd had a very difficult marriage, but then he, he had really just let go and took leaps of consciousness and then he met this other woman, married her, and she's like a soulmate to him now. And, uh, and then he was telling me how he, he said, I'm realizing the power of my mind. So he said, when I, a few years ago, when I was 58, I thought, I love to fly. I just love flying. He flies these jets all over the world and then when he gets off, when he makes it back to Australia and just gets in from Asia or India or someplace, he goes on, he goes to the smaller airplane um, where they have these little hangars and planes and he says, can I fly mail routes and He's just like a kid, he just, he could fly for 10, 12 hours, he gets off, instead of going for a rest, he goes and has a spontaneous holy encounter and he's off flying a mail route, uh, off to the bush or something. And, and he was so full of joy and energy, like we were talking, just this energy was pouring from him. And so he said, when he was 58, he just thought, he realized that there's a international limit for pilots, was uh, 60 years, and he thought, oh my gosh, two years and I can't fly anymore. Uh, he, so he said, I, I went, I wrote a choose file, he called it. He said, I, Les Blim, when uh, two months before I reached my 60th birthday, all of the rules for pilots all over the world internationally will change. They will raise the age limit from 60 to 65. Uh, you know, kind of like, I'm going for it, you know. <laughs> like, oh, I, and he showed his wife, you know. He said, do you see this? And he said he went way into his mind, because he's listened to all my stuff, where he went way into the dreamer of the dream, and he brought the choose file to the dreamer, of the entire dream of the cosmos, and the dreamer went, like, so be it, like, so be it. <laughs> so then, a couple of months after he wrote it out, he noticed that they, the different people that would have to meet, different organizations, FAA and the flying organizations, were starting to meet to discuss the age limit for pilots. He was like, mm-hmm. And then he watched, but there was a lot of fighting and fighting and arguing and typical stuff, politics around this thing. So he watched it, turned 59, and the months started to click away. And uh, as the months started to click away when he was 59, uh, the United States was holding out. Everybody else, all the other nations of the world finally had given in, but the United States was saying adamantly, no, 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 no. And then when it got closer and closer, it got right to the two-month uh, period, it was his wife who heard it announced on the television. She came in and she said, well, the United States caved in. <laughs> they just changed the age limit from 60 to 65 for every pilot in the world. And he's like, 
<laughs> so when he met me, he had he wanted to do one-on-ones and everything because he still had whims, still wanted had a few ideas in his mind for better illusions, and and sometimes he would he would do a little choose file and take it into the dreamer, and the dreamer would go, no, mm -mm. <laughs> and he would be fascinated, <laughs> and then that was his question, why? <laughs> it's like, why you know why that and. So we had some powerful experiences because one of the no's was uh, he likes, he really, really wants to fly the big, big jets, the jumbo jets, the ones that are like flying apartments, they're so huge. But you have to be at the very, in Qantas you got to be at the top of the seniority list to fly the jumbo jets, just only the pilots there at the top. And he had participated in a, a controversial strike where he supported some of the younger pilots and some of their demands probably walked off with them and he took a long time before he went back, coming back from the strike. And so they just, they just decided to, to deduct 25 years of seniority from his uh, flying record for participating in the strike. So they put him from, from being like maybe three, four, five in the, in all the whole Qantas system down to 900 and something, not even close. And so he was like petitioning the dreamer of the dream. <laughs> I want to fly like a little boy. I want to fly the jumbos. I want to fly the jumbos. I want to fly the jumbos. And so he said, there's some lesson here, isn't there? And I said, yeah. He said, yeah, it's, it's the same lesson you were talking about, about the manifesting and going the next step. You know, are you going to go for the state of mind or are you going to go for the form that you believe would bring you the happiness? which is always, you know, the ego's always got some idea of what it would be. And so, we spent a day, one-on-one, -on -one talking about it, and then the next day we had a day of silence. And then he, he and his wife wrote me a note when I met them on the day of silence, can the Holy Spirit make an exception, I have something to talk to you about, and pass me the note. I said, let's go to a restaurant. So we went, and his wife said, we've got an important meeting uh, we were supposed to go to tonight with one of his colleagues, another pilot, and she said, I really think, you know, we should go. I said, yeah, I think it's a good idea. So they went to the meeting, the dinner meeting, and here was one of the ones that are at the top, the, the, the pilots that fly the jumbo jets. It was like the Holy Spirit was going to say, here you go. Yeah. And he meets with this guy and his wife, and they're talking, and this guy is at the top, up near the top of the seniority list, flies the jumbo jets. He's got some kind of a little tick and twitch, <laughs> you know, he's, he's had to play by all the rules, you know, go against his heart maybe, and he didn't support the strike, and he didn't do this, this didn't follow his heart. He's got a bit of a tick and twitch and everything, and the more that they, they talk to him, uh, he's, this, this guy's saying, oh yeah, and my wife and I, we sleep in separate bedrooms, and this and this and this, and, and Les is just watching, going, and the Spirit's going, there you go. Uh, is that what you, <laughs> if you want, he flies the jumbo jets, you, you want the whole package. Uh, kind of like the movie The Butterfly Effect, you know, you can, you can have this, but it throws other things. And so he was like, wow, he said, I, I'm seeing now that I, I need to look at what I'm asking for here, you know, because he was, he was seeing, okay, I've got a powerful mind, but what do I want to do with it? And then he said he, he said, he came in one day with a big grin on his face and he said, I wrote another choose file. I said, what did you write? And he said, I wrote, I want to be in the same state of consciousness that David is in consistently before I die. <laughs> and he said he took it to the dreamer and the dreamer was like, <laughs> So it was a state of mind goal. He was going for the peace of mind, even though he He'd used the power of his mind in the, with the raising the age limit, you know, it was like, it was a, a manifestation. Some people would say, quite a, a good yeah. manifestation, <laughs> the worldwide rules for pilots, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but that's what we're talking about, is taking it so deep that you realize that, that you are entitled to miracles, you are entitled to a state of constant peace and happiness and joy, and no matter how unrealistic the ego wants to paint that picture to be, uh, that, as Jesus says, you really never be content with anything less than the love that you are. Uh, you can try to content yourself 
in time and space and you can actually get to a point where you forgive it and see a very happy dream which is as high as you can go in this realm so to speak but but you'll never be content with anything less than than God's love and he says in the in the text uh, of a course of miracles and maybe it's back in the workbook he says you know it's not that you ask for too much out of life but it's that you ask for far too little you know you you just kind of offer up your little prayers you know keep me safe and and help me with this and help me out financially and he's saying oh you could ask for you could ask for everything and it's like you've got a little thimble and you're going please fill my cup <laughs> and God's like oh yeah I could fill it and much more but you have to you have to take the, the limits and the parameters off of your asking and start to open up your asking so that you see that you deserve <coughs> you're worthy of, of love so it's those are good little parables and stories I think that, that kind of put things into context that there's nothing wrong with asking for anything uh, at all but it's like when you're entitled to to such fullness and such grace then why why settle for less is kind of what it comes down to.